and welcome back to the Napoleon Assist and another installment of the digital wargaming element of Wargaming Month. We are back. I am rejoined by my good friend Josh Proven, uh, Master of Adventures in History Land and author of Bullock's Grain and Good Madeira, who I've spoken to on a number of episodes in the past. And if you want a full breakdown of his book, uh, then you can find that on a previous episode over on the main channel, the Napoleon Assist podcast. A little while back, we brought you an instalment looking at Napoleon Total War and the way in which somebody tried to translate the complexities and realities of war during the Napoleonic era into a video game. And we talked through some of the ways in which they got it right, some of the ways that they didn't. And in a future instalment, we will talk you through how you then play that out in reality in an actual scenario, in a, in a proper battle as we recreate Ligny. But there is a whole other half to the Napoleon Total War story, which we never covered, which is the naval battles. And so today we're going to run through a couple of scenarios uh, for you just to sort of demonstrate um, the, the way in which the, the, the game tried to um, recreate the naval element during this period. And we're going to have a little bit of a laugh along the way. There are some slightly ridiculous things uh, that have been thrown into this one because the game enables them to be there. Um, some certainly some anachronistic things. But Josh, welcome back. Good to see you again. How are you doing, my friend? I'm feeling all at sea, Zach. Oh, boom. Very uh -huh. good. Very, <laughs> very good. Uh, no bad puns on this show. Um, we're going to dive straight, straight Let's in. Let's choose between the lesser of two weevils. Oh, no, no, Josh. <laughs> I'm, I do love that quote, but I'm going to veto it. Um, the first thing that our, our watchers will notice is, yes, that is a paddle steam frigate. Me neither. Um, and, and over here, you're going to enjoy this even more from an anachronism point of view. This is an ironclad. Yes, they've included an ironclad in Napoleon Total War. I'll be honest with you, I don't know why. Uh, they, they just did. It was as simple as that. Uh, and so we just threw them in there just to sort of show how overpowered the, the ironclad is. Um, but also on my deployment screen at this moment in time, we have a rocket ship because I want to show you how volatile they were, a bomb catch, uh, and then some standard uh, 74 gun frigates, um, and a, a super heavy, if you like, a 122 heavy first rate. Um, so you're talking your HMS Victory class of ship there. Uh, but the 74 gun being quite typical of the time. Uh, and in a moment, we'll see Josh's deployment screen. The first thing I want to mention on this is the wind. The wind was everything I felt in these battles, sort of as it was during the period. Josh, what's your, your kind of feeling on how they tried to make the mechanics of naval battles work? I think that they were able to borrow from naval warfare games that had come before this that had effectively used the wind. They were mostly like pirates and stuff like that. Um, nothing that I'd ever played quite so sort of sophisticated as this, I should say, but a lot of the dynamics of naval warfare that I had seen in other games to do with seafaring uh, were noticeable. Um, and their approach to it is essentially an update on Empire Total War's naval engine, which we said was a, a similar factor on the, on the land battles. Um, and I think that whereas, in a way, playing Empire's land battles are, are kind of, in a way, more satisfying than Napoleon's, maybe just because the troop types are a little bit more cool looking, um, the naval battles in Napoleon Total War are better than the naval battles in Empire. So I think they did a very good job except for the weird thing where they had to include ironclads and, and steam-powered uh, ships because, as all Total War games run, usually over the time period that they're supposed to cover, you're allowed to do modifications, I guess, to the factions, so that's why you have them. That's my best explanation. But overall, the naval I like the naval battles. I agree. In fact, I would say I prefer the, the naval battles to the land-based battles. 
um, just mm. because I, up until very recently, I would have said that I, I was just better at them. Um, there are reasons, which you'll see in future episodes, where that may not necessarily be true. Uh, I've also started moving forward the ironclads here um, and, and the steam frigates. And what I'm starting to do is demonstrate the wind element. So if you turn the ships into wind, the, the sails are furled and inevitably the ship slows down because that's how it works in this period. But you'll see the ironclad very quickly catches up because it's powered by steam and therefore mm -hmm. doesn't have that same level of concern. Um, but but we should mention that the weird thing about this little steam engine here is that because like if you actually did have a engine on a ship and you were sailing it as you're doing right into the wind you're going to have a weird counteraction of the force of the engines driving it forward and the sails holding it back you would have to pull in those sails to get the best out of the engine because you just ha you're just basically working against yourself here hmm. the other issue of course is that if you're going to stick a paddle on the edge of your ship um that's <laughs> that's a sitting target um so uh, listeners may be able to correct me if i'm wrong here and josh you're more knowledgeable in these things than i am but i was fairly convinced that there was a lot of skepticism about the usefulness of steam um initially when they're, they're using the paddle steamer design to propel ships because they these these paddles are just too vulnerable in the scope of a battle uh definitely and i think it's sort of telling that steam technology was very slowly put into the line of battle and you you get it by the 1840s such as on like the i believe it's the first ironclad ironcladded steamship nemesis which is famous for its actions in the in the opium war um but it's, it's still a very kind of hybrid thing with a lot of the old brigades who say sailors more than good enough and you cannot put these, start, these sort of, you can't, how, first of all, how are you going to get a paddle big enough to put on a seven, on like a hundred gun, a three deck battleship. And also it's just going to be ridiculously easy to shoot to pieces. So they did have a point. It wasn't just like, oh, oh pagan, pagan engines on our beautiful, <laughs> sail powered uh, ships absolutely um there we go that's what i was waiting for the, the the explosion just to sort of highlight how these ships are our tinder boxes you see a morale element involved here the rocket ship has surrendered having done effectively no damage and, and these were deliberately kind of sent forward on a stupid suicide mission and you can see that Josh now has the momentum. Yes, these are big ships. He went super heavy the whole way. I wasn't <laughs> quite anticipating this, but they are all 122 uh, mm. gun ships. Did you have a, a Santa Sima Trinidad in, yeah, in the, in the lead? Yeah. Oh, yes. So there you go, 140 guns, um, which is, I think, mainly the reason that things play out in the way that they do. Yeah, um, I, I kind of... because. One of the things, like we said in the episode about the land battles, um, France and Britain are prioritized in terms of the power of the faction. You know, you can take on a lot of people with France and Britain in the Napoleon Total War. Now with the Royal Navy, they are ridiculously overpowered when it comes to the naval battles. The French aren't bad, the Spanish are probably rated third. But usually, if the guy with the Royal Navy wins, just it. So I thought for the good, of, the good of the demo, I'd better choose the best ships in the Spanish Navy, um, not realizing. <laughs> well, I figured I would lose despite the over, overwhelming uh, superiority in artillery that, I'm, that I, I can displace. Or at least that's the excuse that he's given me ever <laughs> since. Um, so what we're doing here is demonstrating sort of the classic Nelsonian inverted commas tactic, which of course isn't Nelsonian because the basic concept of splitting uh, or, or cutting through your enemy's line um, was was far, you know, it predates Nelson. Um, but you do get a nice indication, firstly, of just the graphics quality of this game when it came to 
these naval battles. They looked quite good. Um, they, they got a lot of things right when it came to these broadsides. If you've ever watched the YouTube videos of um, simulations of HMS Victory firing a broadside, you get things that look a little bit similar to this. You know, there was this sort of vague sense that some work was done, although the all guns firing at once thing does bug me slightly because I'm reasonably confident that if you fired all of the hundred and something guns on victory at once, you'd probably shake the ship to pieces uh, in the process. Very possible. I'm not uh, not great on physics, but it, I doubt it would do the structure much good. Um, I'm not even sure how you'd manage it either. Sort of, uh, it's a very long ship um, to coordinate a simultaneous discharge of artillery like that, and also probably unadvisable since you don't want to unload every gun anyway. This um, is very true. Um, and the... here's an interesting thing. Routing ships. This is my biggest problem with naval warfare in this game. Oh, but this one's on fire, so it's not entirely a, a fair thing. Um, True. But they, they, can... they, but they, they have this weird thing, don't they, where they follow the, the basic dynamics of the land battles and that these ships can run away. Uh, as indeed, oh, this one's also on fire. Um, so again, that's perhaps a slightly unfair I mean, it doesn't it doesn't really matter nobody tried to i mean i guess i guess if the ship's on fire and you can get it away that is a reasonable reasonable reason to to, to go away but the, the, you know they route you know they don't withdraw they don't retreat they take panic and everybody on the ship apparently according to this game <laughs> just decides as one we are leaving the battle <laughs> it it does have that sort of slightly monty python-esque air of run away run away run away um, and if you've ever seen the gif of, of that, uh, you will know exactly what I mean. Everybody just sort of drops their weapons and, and flees. Um, that ship has now surrendered. It is on fire. It may in time explode or it may sink. Um, we don't, oh, we do have a damage indicator. Probably won't sink. Um, but this was one of the things that you, you will see. Uh, so another 74s has gone. Um, the ironclad and the paddle steamer sitting way out there doing nothing at this stage because they weren't having a good time just having some tea indeed indeed um but you can see the sort of the damage racking up uh, on these ships and the idea was that once you got to a certain point then your hull integrity went um there you go there's a classic example this is a 122 gun ship that has decided to run away it is fleeing for its life um yeah it was an odd thing I, there was a lot that they got right with the naval battle, so I always mm. forgave that. Um, mm -hmm. the, the way in which the dynamics of, of gaining the wind, um, I know it's sort of a meme, but that whole kind of master and commander element of having the weather gauge, um, it really does mean that you can dictate an engagement. Um, we, what we've seen here is a pell-mell style battle, which was precisely mm -hmm. the point of what we were trying to, to demonstrate. Um, and inevitably Josh wins because he's just got more guns. Um... <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that I find with the naval battles actually is that, I mean, they take a bit of getting used to. They're quite, they're quite difficult, actually. You can pick up how to win a um, land battle really quite easily, but the AI is much tougher at sea than it is on land to, de to defeat, actually. What I tend to find is that if you, inverted commas, do an ALSA, mm -hmm you tend to win. It's sort of as, as simple as that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's definitely a thing because I would normally like to try and keep the ships in line of stern so I can control them all. And normally I lose when I do that. And it's interesting that in this battle, this, this demo, that when you cut the line, I broke the line of stern and sent them all in different directions. Um, and immediately everybody started to perform better because they went fixed to the leading, to the leading ship, and that's an interesting aspect of the game as well. You can you can set you can set all the ships to follow the one in front, so it's nice and easy to maneuver. This is true. Um, it, it as you're going to see when we run the scenario again, 
uh, or run a proper scenario, I should say, uh, it does lead to some interesting troop movements that end up being quite convoluted. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, that's worth saying that you can, you can group units as well. So you can actually form on the land battles, you can form brigades, and that's quite a nice little feature. That's a continuation of something that you could do way back in, in Rome, Total War, um, and, and even before that, so medieval Total War. Um, at this point, what we're doing is we're sending in the Ironclad and the Paddle Seamer just mm -hmm. to um, speed up the scenario. In fact, I'm going to hit the, the speed up button. Um, the, the weather gauge. Are, but they are pretty simplistic in terms of their basic dynamics, because obviously, you'd, the, like you're saying, the most important thing about it is considering where the wind is relative to what you want to do. And um, Yes, it's, it's really wonderful actually how it makes you think tactically about the weather gauge. And as we'll, when we do our own tactical scenario, you'll see that the weather gauge kind of can be used in many ways in the game to, um, to fight battles. Yes, I'm actually, I, I won't comment on that, but because uh, we don't want to spoil the enjoyment of uh, our viewers when, when we get to that. But yes, that. There were some there were some surprises in store uh, in that one, uh, shall I say? Uh, my initial smugness was not entirely justified. Um, so ironclad's taking a bit of a pasting. Um, yeah. As you can see, because it's an ironclad, it's stupidly overpowered and it's registering zero damage at this stage. Um, I see. You're also um, sort of you've done that thing where you're. Specifically, have you narrowed the narrowed the the broadsides? So you I have. Yes, this is a very okay. peculiar feature. So you can concentrate your fire, uh, which is what I'm doing with these two in an effort to try and inflict some significant damage. The frigate, as you can see, it's got fewer guns, so it's not really doing much in terms of damage. Um, the Exeter is running away, um, and yeah, where, where to, to is anyone's guess. As, you know, that guy's going to get shot for cowardice. But this was the other bizarre thing. We tried to make the boarding element work. It did. So you, have, you have the facility to fire different types of shots. You can go with the mm. standard round shot, or you can use anti-personnel round, i.e. grape shot, or you can use bar shot to try and take out rigging and, and masts and so on. Um, in the end, you never... Did you manage to board... Oh, you managed to we did. Grappling hooks we, over, but I'd we did. Yes, I think we had. We think we did it with a different ship, though, and there wasn't that absurd thing where they chased each other round and round like ducks. Um, yes, this is true. This is very true. Um, in fact, we might see that happen with uh, Ironclad in just a moment. The frigate is running away um, at quite remarkable speed. Um, it has to be said. Ironclad comes around again. Um, but yeah, the boarding function, I always thought the boarding function was far, far too clunky. Um, it's, it's, yeah, here we go. Now they're, yeah. they're circling each other. It, it's but like the bizarre the thing. thing it's you like outturn me. Yeah, you know, it's like, this is like, what, what, that's 122 guns ship of the line. And it's turning on, you know, a two penny piece. It's just slightly mental. I think it's we said like, it yeah. as we were recording it. It's like that scene in um, Pirates of the Caribbean where they're fighting around the maelstrom, mm. whirlpool. Um, and in the end, I told you, just look, stop your ship. I'm coming alongside you and then I will board you. To so um, show the people what it looks like. And then... Exactly. <laughs> um, I think the least boarding function is a little, maybe a little broken. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I was never really convinced by it. If I'm, if I'm honest, unless you had a, a massive advantage in numbers. Um, but the designs were really neat as well, I yeah. thought. Uh, I mean, look at the, the effort to sort of get some of the detailing right. Yes, very obviously they've gone to Portsmouth. In fact, they say they've mm -hmm. been to the, the um, Naval History Museum in Portsmouth mm -hmm. and they credit uh, the ship designs and the ship layouts that they've used to the research that was done there. Mm -hmm. But it's a, just a nice little indication that the effort was made to get some of these elements right. And still, this boarding isn't working. I think at this point, you've decided to board me. Yeah. And, and therefore, and at last, have to circle all the way around. Uh, uh, yeah. And then it, turns, then it comes around the other side and it works for some reason. I've just noticed 
And obviously, uh, and as we said before, this is based heavily on the Empire Total War uh, sea battle engine. And it was a big deal at the time because Total War had never done sea battles. You just had this lame auto, uh, auto resolve function on any sea battle in Rome or medieval and stuff like that. So this was the first one. Empire was the first one that did naval battles. But I've just noticed that the Marines and sailors are all like this weird 17th century, not even 18th century, 17th century looking guys um, as a hangover from, from Empire, I think. Yeah, you're right. Uh, apart from this guy with his nice little bike on. Yeah. Uh, that is, that is a nice very, hat. It's a nice hat. It's, nice hat. It's, it's a nice hat, but he's wearing red. And this is a problem because he should be in navy blue. This is very true. Um, you know, well, the Spanish maybe... are in yellow. Yes, it's all quite, it's all quite odd. It's all quite odd. Some of the graphics sort of don't line up exactly, do they? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you got to give. I, I give them a break for that because this can't have been easy to to design. <laughs> but no, it can't. Um, but yeah, there you go. We shall speed it up. Uh, the unclad is the only. That's that's all we have to show you, really, in how this the mechanics work. But that gives you a little bit of a taster of um, just what they tried to do when it came to naval war gaming. Um, let us know your thoughts down below in the comments. How does it compare from your experiences of trying to do naval war gaming using plastic models? Are there elements that you think could have been done better, should have been done better? Uh, and what are your experiences? We will be back in a few days time to show you how if you try and play competitively, it doesn't necessarily go how you might think. Uh, and on that little teaser, uh, this has been The Napoleon Assist. I've been joined by Josh Proven. Thank you very much for watching. Remember to like and subscribe, and we'll see you again very soon.